Welcome everyone. So today um, we're going to be continuing our lecture on World War II. And I have to find the lecture notes that I intend to use. Cats are torturing me. All right. So lecture notes on uh, World War II here. Um, I just pulled them up and I'm ready to go. Thanks for tuning in for those uh, four of you who are here. I'm just gonna take a look and see how many people actually did this documentary. Very good. Well, today we're picking up where we left off last time, talking about, uh, we, we left off last time just talking about France and the fall of France in World War II. Um, remember, uh, the first part of that war was that Sitzkrieg period, where there wasn't, um, there wasn't much fighting uh, between the Western powers. Um, most of them were kind of trying to shore up their defenses, uh, the French along the Maginot Line and the Germans along the Siegfried line. And uh, then when Hitler decides to make his move starting in about April of 1940, six months after invading Poland, or seven months after invading uh, Poland, Hitler makes his move and starts invading other places in Scandinavia, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, um, and, then, uh, and then into the Low Countries, Belgium, uh, the Netherlands and Luxembourg, and then um, by that point he's taken over a vast majority of Europe already. Um, 
they're using a particular tactic that we talked about last time called the Blitzkrieg. That's that lightning warfare tactic where they're trying to do a really rapid assault to quickly uh, overthrow the uh, enemy's forces or surround the enemy's forces and, um, and then rapidly move forward and, and, uh, and force them to surrender. They do this very effectively when they cut through southern Belgium in the invasion of France and push the French troops back into their own Maginot line um, and also separate them, forcing the other troops uh, in the northern part of France to retreat to Dunkirk. Um, Hitler is not going to be facing at this time any problems from the east from Russia because Hitler, before the war had begun, reached out to Stalin and had signed that nuclear, or excuse me, uh, not nuclear, that uh, non-aggression treaty. And uh, let's talk a little bit about what happens in France. So, um... I'm going to pull up a map here so I can use that to kind of uh, demonstrate. Seeing as I don't have a, an official, uh, I don't have an official PowerPoint to show to you guys. So, um, So if you take a look at this at this map here, uh, let me pull up this one so you can see a little better. All right, so this map here is a map of France. Now these territories um, were annexed over to Germany. So if you remember, there was a war between Russia, uh, excuse me, between France and Germany in 1870. It was called the Franco-Prussian War, and in that war, this area right here was called Alsace-Lorraine. And Alsace-Lorraine was an area of kind of combined French-German citizenry, but it had traditionally belonged to France for a long time. But at the end of the 1800s, they took this uh, land. Well, in World War I, when Germany is defeated, this land is then given back to the French, so it's restored back to the old territory. Now that Hitler has taken over France after subduing them inside of six weeks, uh, this territory goes back into the possession of Germany. And I think I told you that story where Hitler's bitterness resulted in him finding down the same railway car, tr tracking down the same railway car that the Germans were forced to sign the Treaty of Versailles terms. And he forces France to sign the terms of their surrender, sitting in the exact same place that Germany did. And in their terms of their surrender, these regions right here get returned back to Germany at that time. Now, of course, today these lands are back under French control because Germany lost World War II in the end. But during World War II, those lands belong to Germany. Now, you're going to notice that there's two major regions here in this, uh, in this map of France. This is a World War II map of France. The northern region of France was called the Occupied Zone the occupied zone uh, and the, there's a difference between the occupied zone and the free zone so here's the thing about France the Nazis um, fighting this war didn't want to waste troops trying to directly administer all sorts of different um, uh, provinces of France in the south here can you see on this map how it's divided into smaller provinces Hitler doesn't want to take and waste Nazi forces on these smaller provinces because the thing about France is that pretty much south of Paris, the vast majority of France is going to be mostly rural agricultural areas. And Hitler is not concerned about them mounting a uh, proper insurrection to overthrow Nazi rule. So what Hitler does is he actually takes um, a couple of Nazi people, uh, administrative type people, and puts them right here at Vichy. And Vichy becomes the cap, Vichy France becomes known as the free French zone of France. Uh, it is not actually free, it is a puppet government where um, you have French, col uh, uh, French administers of these various regions here who are essentially under Nazi rule, but it's, it's France being administered 
uh, by the Nazis, but just, you know, in a very kind of like, in a very indirect rule sort of a way. And when you remember that term indirect rule, it's the same term that we use when the British went to India and basically said, look, we don't want to just, we don't want to take over everything and run everything. We want you guys to keep your local people in place, but just know that you're going to be taking orders from these couple of British guys at the top here. Okay, so that's kind of how the Nazis do it in uh, in southern France, in the Vichy area. Now, why doesn't he? Because, again, this area is totally rural, and there's not going to be a lot of threat posed by Vichy France in the south. Now, in the north and along the coasts, in particular along the coasts, France had a vast navy. And because they still have a vast navy, Hitler doesn't want the French navy going rogue and, um, and attacking uh, Nazi forces. Uh, particularly assisting the British on the high seas. And so Hitler um, does directly administer the occupied zone is where there is direct military occupation of France, and that's in these regions in the northern areas. Okay. Um, and, then, uh, and then here's up here is Dunkirk. Okay, Dunkirk is where they escaped from to go across the English Channel back to England at uh, um, in June of 1940. Now these this area the occupied zone is going to take some degree of um, direct military occupation um, and that means that Hitler is going to assign some lower ranking generals probably uh, to these regions here lower ranking officers he eventually down the line when the war isn't going as well for Germany he does bring Rommel who was one of his more advanced, uh, uh, or one of his better officers, uh, ger generals, uh, field, field marshals, that's what I was looking for. One is more better, his, uh, one of his better field marshals, and he brings them up here to this region, and they create something called the Atlantic Wall. And that the Atlantic Wall was supposed to be an area, it was supposed to be impenetrable. In other words, people shouldn't be able to get across it. The idea being basically that if the Allied forces had wanted to enter France uh, along the coast to start a western occupation they would have to get through the Atlantic wall first but um, it's you know it's a, we're talking about a huge 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 uh, amount of coastline here and there isn't an actual physical wall that was built it's um, there are defensive fortifications all along the coast but it's not like a, a great wall that's built all along the coast of France or anything like that it's just it's just uh, se at several key points where invasions would have been more likely. They put, um, they put defensive turrets and other tunnels and systems like that uh, to try to prevent any sort of um, amphibious attack coming in from the western coast of France. Of course, if you know anything about World War II, that doesn't turn out as well down the line in 1944 uh, when the Allied forces launched the D-Day invasion in Normandy, which is right about here. So, um, let's move back here to me, and I'll just continue talking about this stuff. Um, basically, after France is subdued, there is a period of time where, um, where a guy named Charles de Gaulle, who was kind of a lower-ranking officer, in, he was like a tank commander in the French military. The French military, by this point, you don't know which way they're going to go. Uh, some folks in the French military, like Marshal Pétain, who was a hero of World War I, Marshal Pétain was uh, a French governmental figure at this time, and he ends up famously flip-flopping and becoming a Nazi collaborator. So even though Marshal Pétain was previously a French general who fought in World War I, now he's an elderly um, guy, he's not in the military anymore. And, um, and he's a governmental figure, political figure, and, and he ends up collaborating with the Nazis, as a lot of French governmental figures do. Now, not everybody in France likes the Nazis. There's not a lot of love between the French and the Germans by the time that we get to World War II. But there are a number of people at the upper echelons of the French government that end up collaborating with the Nazis to try to prevent the Nazis from destroying their country. Um, through some sort of like resistance movement. Now, Charles de Gaulle is not going to be one of those guys. Charles de Gaulle escapes and he sets up a base in London where he would, uh, 
um, basically try and be an inspirational figure via the radio waves uh, for what were known as the Free Fe French Forces, the Free French Forces or the fi uh, Free French Fighters. And these people were primarily located in northern Africa where French's, uh, France's colonial assets were. And, um, and in other places as well, like Britain and stuff. But, but a lot of free French forces fought in North Africa against the Nazis who were trying to, um, who, uh, were trying to take over that region as well in Northern Africa. And, um, and so the free French forces were a resistance force. Uh, the free French are led by Charles de Gaulle remotely for the most part. Charles de Gaulle, to be honest with you, Roosevelt wasn't a big fan. Um, the president of the United States at the time, um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Roosevelt, didn't really trust de Gaulle. He felt that Charles de Gaulle had a lot of like personal, uh, personal ambitions that mm, maybe lent him some characteristics of kind of tyrannical sort of dictatorial style of governance. Uh, so Charles de Gaulle is not high up on the list of favorite people for FDR, but uh, the Prime Minister of Britain at this time, whose name is Winston Churchill, really likes Charles de Gaulle, and they get along very well. Um, so after France falls, and we've talked about the Free French Forces, we talked about Vichy France, after France falls, Hitler redirects his attention to Britain. <clears throat> which, if he can take Britain, is pretty much going to put the nail in the coffin for uh, for Europe. It's gonna if if Hitler can take Britain, uh, this is going to spell disaster for democracy in Europe, and it could have resulted in uh, it could have resulted in quite a, a different you know history uh, today if Britain had fell. But the main moral of the story for what's known as the Battle of Britain, which is pretty much one of the most critical battles in the whole war, is that Britain does not surrender. They absolutely refuse to surrender. And part of that is thanks to the supreme wartime leadership of Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Britain during this time, who is giving radio addresses, uh, encouraging the population not to give in to the Germans, encouraging the population to pick up arms, meet them on the beaches, meet them on the landing pads, meet them everywhere, uh, and never, never, never surrender. And the British population demonstrates almost a sort of like bitter, you know how the British are, they have a certain character about them. They're, they, it's like, the British uh, just have a certain nationalistic quality about them where they just really are, uh, even, even in scenarios where maybe they shouldn't be, they have a certain, they have a certain stoicism to them where they're not going to let anyone tell them differently. And um, so what happens as the British are being bombed into absolute submission by the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, the Royal Air Force, the British Air Force, puts up a, a, an amazing, amazing resistance. Uh, and as they are being bombed relentlessly, the Royal Air Force fights back. And the British citizens, who aren't even part of the military, continue going about their daily lives. They go to work if they can, if their work hasn't been blown up. Um, their, if their homes were blown up, they started in like sleeping in the underground in London. There's a giant underground tunnel system called the tube, which is the uh, London underground. It's a subway system and, uh, the London underground, the tube, as they sometimes call it, uh, was, became the new residence for people whose houses and apartment blocks had been blown out by Nazi bombs. Now, the kinds of planes that the Nazis were using to attack uh, London at this time are primarily going to be a particular kind of dive bombing plane called a Stuka, S-T-U-K-A, a Stuka dive bomber plane. Now, the Stuka is, uh, is actually the name of the plane is a Junker, which is spelled J-U-N-K-E-R. Junker is a name for the Prussian noble class, so before Germany became unified, um, Germany used to be a multitude of states 
39 different states in what was known the, as the, uh, the German Bund, or the Deutsche Bund, uh, also known as the German Confederacy. And these, the largest of those 39 states was Prussia, which was, uh, going back to the late 1600s, a military, uh, a, like a military powerhouse. They were only the fourth largest army in Europe, but they were the most powerful standing army in Europe, particularly for their size. Um, the Prussians were the ones who, who uh, invented things like, um, you know, uh, you know, military drill style instruction, drill instruction, um, and and things like that. So they would do like, uh, and they also organized their military into. Um, into regiments and divisions and all that sort of stuff. So uh, the Prussians had a very organized and disciplined military, and the officers in the Prussian military were known as Junkers. So that's where the name of the Junker plane comes from, as it's named after the Prussian noble class. And the Prussian noble class um, no longer exists in Germany at this time, but you do have some older kind of Prussian dudes from before uh, when, when Germany was still known as Prussia, who are still around, um, like Hindenburg was an old Prussian dude and he ends up dying, but um, Hindenburg was an old Prussian. And then you've got like other old, old Prussian dudes like Heinz Guderian. Heinz Guderian was a very uh, uh, well-known tank uh, uh, general, tank field marshal for the Nazis. Um, and so he's the one who's put in charge of the invasion of Russia down the line, which we'll get to later. Um, and, and the guy that's put in charge of the, um, of the Luftwaffe is a guy by the name of Hermann Goering. Hermann Goering. Now, Hermann Goering is one of the hardcore uh, upper echelon Nazis. He's not an old Prussian dude. Hermann Goering was like an SS guy. And he's put in charge of the Air Force, and Hermann Goering is, uh, he's kind of this fat uh, guy, fat German dude, and he's a super, super, super anti-Semite, and he basically makes a promise to Hitler that he will bomb Britain into submission. So Hermann Goering is, a, is an upper echelon Nazi figure. Heinz Guderian is a high-ranking Wehrmacht. Guy. He's not an SS guy. Um, Heinz Guderian's like an old Prussian tank commander general. He wasn't really involved in the in the in like the Holocaust and stuff like that. He's more of a military figure. But Hermann Goering is, and he's the one who's also in charge of the of the of the uh, Luftwaffe. Now these planes that I was about to tell you about, these dive bombing planes, they're called the Junker Ju eighty seven. That's the name of the model of the plane, Junker Ju-87. And what this plane does is it has a siren fixed to the top, or to the front of it. So when this plane dives, the air, um, the air, the airspeed of the plane increases, and it causes this siren to start spooling up in in uh, on the front of the plane, and it makes this horrifying horrifying shrieking screaming noise um, that that uh, as the plane dives it it as it as that siren winds up the pitch of the siren gets higher and higher and higher and it's a psychological warfare thing so it, it terrorized people and if you heard the siren the stuka sirens start up in the middle of the night that meant probably you were going to be bombed pretty, or darn near close to being bombed. And they would have air raid sirens uh, also, uh, which were defensive sirens to alert people that the Stukas were on their way, if they could detect them. Um, the British, in, in terms of detecting the planes, actually did develop radar at this time, which was a brand new technology. And so the way that radar works is it bounces signals off of uh, stuff. And those signals bounce back, and it lets you know, with only a marginal delay, uh, the position of objects in the sky. And then in the in the water, they use sonar, which is bouncing sound off of objects, like for example, submarines, uh, in in the water. And so, radar and sonar uh, 
become increasingly important technologies to the British to be able to detect when the Germans are going to be able to attack. Another thing that the British do is that they are the ones who, um, who decipher uh, after sh uh, there's a ship called the HMS uh, Bulldog. The HMS Bulldog was a British ship that recovers a device called the Enigma device. And what the Enigma device was, was a German uh, coding tool that was a cipher that allowed the Germans to encode all of their messages uh, quite cleverly. And it, was, uh, it would have worked really, really well if the British hadn't recovered this machine. So the, Enigma, the recovery of the Enigma machine allowed the British to crack the German code. Now, here's the thing about that. You've got to be careful. You've got to play this coyly. Because if you crack their code and then you start predicting their every move, they're going to know that the code has been cracked because you're too good. So the trick about the Enigma machine was making it seem like they still hadn't cracked the code. And, uh, but that happens a little bit later in the war. But nonetheless, the British are using these new technology. There's another technology that the British are using. The, the Germans, one of the techniques that the Germans used to disrupt British shipping, because remember the, the strength of the British military is going to be their navy. And the British navy was um, still a, a very large and formidable force by the time that World War II breaks out, they have very, very advanced ships. And one of the ways that the Germans disrupted British shipping, and Brit which is, applies to both merchant shipping but also their uh, military ships, is that they would, um, they would create minefields. And the, uh, the British ships, the way that these mines originally worked is that they were magnetic mines. So as the British ships would go through a minefield, um, these magnetic mines would be attracted to the side of the metal ship and they would have these, it looked like a sea urchin, so it would be like a sphere with these pokey things on it. And if you sail into one, those pokey things, if they, if they are depressed, um, they'll blow up the mine. If they're magnetic, they'll float towards the ship, touch the side of the ship, and blow a hole in the side of the hole. So what the British did was they came up with a new technique called degaussing, which rendered the side of the ship um, no longer magnetic. So magnetic sea mines stopped working with British ships because of this degaussing technology. Now degaussing works only if you have magnetic mines. It doesn't work if you just sail directly into the mines. It also doesn't work against torpedoes. So degaussing probably has a slightly less effective um, uh, role in the war than, say, radar does. Also, the British were really clever with decoys. They used fake planes, fake ships, fake embankments, fake all sorts of fake things, fake guns, and would, would really trick the Germans into thinking that they had stuff laid out that the Germans could see, but really their real equipment would have been covered up in, in camouflage and things like that. Now, as the bombing of London, uh, so the, the Royal Air Force was really struggling at first to keep up with the Luftwaffe and the amount of bombing because originally when Hitler was bombing, I don't need, by the way, I'm doing this all from memory. I'm not even looking at the notes. I'm just looking at myself lecture, which is so stupid. But as the, as the um, bombing of Britain started, they focused mostly on military targets. And, um, and, and the Royal Air Force was struggling to keep up, but um, was still performing admirably, admirably, particularly thanks to a type of plane that the um, British used. They had two planes that were very important, the Spitfire and the Hurricane. Those two planes, the Spitfire in particular, the Spitfire had a, um, keep in mind planes at this time are still very simple, jet technology, jet engines don't exist yet. So planes are run on, on engines, on regular engines. So um, the engine that went into the 
Spitfire was called, uh, it was a Rolls-Royce engine, a V12 Rolls-Royce engine that put out like a thousand horsepower or something like that. It was a really well-built engine. I think it's called the Merlin engine, if I'm not mistaken. But that Rolls-Royce engine was the engine that really allowed these planes to be very effective in combating their fighter planes. And the, the Germans were prim primarily using dive bombing planes. And so these fighter planes were quick, they were maneuverable. Uh, not to say that the Germans didn't have their own fighter planes, surely they did, but the, the British uh, Spitfires in particular were very effective during the Battle of Britain in curtailing the efforts of the German Luftwaffe's bombing of military sites. Now, as the, as the British continued to be resilient, uh, Hermann Goering and Hitler decide that the, uh, that the Royal Air Force, even though it was almost completely destroyed by the Luftwaffe, um, the Royal Air Force was no longer going to be a threat, and they changed their military tactics to stop bombing military sites and start bombing civilian sites. And so Hitler changes his targets to cities in and around London, and, uh, and this ends up being um, a major mistake. It's a fatal error by Hitler, a fatal blunder. Um, because because what, what this does is it allows the Royal Air Force to recuperate. And so the Royal Air Force, after Hitler changes the focus of these bombings to civilian targets, and he does this to try to increase the terror and destroy the um, morale of the British people. But it doesn't work. And it allows the Royal Air Force to have a little bit of a comeback and um, ultimately to defeat the Luftwaffe, and it forces Hitler to call off his planned invasion, which was something called Operation Sea Lion. Operation Sea Lion was supposed to be, once the Royal Air Force had been rendered inoperable, Operation Sea Lion was supposed to be this, um, this, this invasion, this amphibious invasion of the Wehrmacht, the German armed forces, the army, onto the British Isles, to start taking taking over Britain, just the same way that they did with France using blitzkrieg techniques. But because of this uh, change in his tactics, where he starts focusing on these civilian targets, the Royal Air Force bounces back, and Hitler's forced to call off Operation Sea Lion. And it's after that that Hitler calls off altogether the the British, uh, the Battle of, for Britain. So Britain at that point is, is going to be a major factor afterwards in continuing to fight against the Germans. They refuse to surrender. Now at the end of this entire conflict, I'm going to jump over to my notes here. At, this, at the end of this entire conflict, we see that the Germans have lost about 2,500 planes where the Royal Air Force has only lost about 900. And this is in part due to the fact that the Germans, their planes were a bit outdated by this point. The war effort had forced the Germans to focus their economy on other things than just building planes. And so the planes that they had were a few years old. Most of those Stukas were from 1936, 1937. And with the way that technology was progressing at that point, by the time that we get to 1940, 41, those planes are about four or five years old and they're not quite as advanced as planes coming out in 1940, 41, 42 thereafter. So now the significance of, of, of Hitler having to, having to retreat or changes his, and it's not really a retreat, it's just him calling off his attack. I guess it's kind of a retreat, I don't know. It, it's him calling off the offensive of, of um, his attack on Britain. Because of this, he changes his focus to Russia. And this is also considered a major, major, major blunder because when Hitler changes his focus to Russia, no longer uh, does he have the uh, ability to uh, only fight on one front. He is now going to have to face a face off against the British on the Western Front and the Russians on the Eastern Front. And ding, 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 this should ring some bells in your head. Boy, Mr. Knight, that sounds awfully similar to World War I and why it went wrong for Germany. 
Yes, and that's the major, major thing to take away from the Battle of Britain is things could have gone awfully, awfully wrong if Hitler had not made some serious mistakes in his offensives against the British. But thanks to the British not surrendering, send, surrendering, and in particular, a lot of credit is always given to the Royal Air Force, but we have to also remember that the Royal Navy played their part in the battle on the Atlantic during the Battle for Britain as well. You see a lot of, of, um, of uh, British ships who are falling victim to the same kinds of problems that the British ships faced in World War I, which was that unrestricted U-boat warfare. Now, we usually associate that phrase with World War I, but the U-boats were even more advanced and even more deadly than they were in World War I in World War II. And the British ships, um, in particular, there, early on in the war, there was a major, major battle uh, between actually a German battleship uh, as opposed to German submarine. All of the German submarines, the U-boats, have a designation like U-571 or U-32 or U-45 or whatever. It's just a letter and a number. That, that's how the Germans number their things. Um, but there was a, the, the flagship of the German Navy was a ship that got a proper name. It's called Bismarck. Okay, and it was named after Otto von Bismarck, who was the leader of the unification movement in Germany back in the 1800s, uh, late 1800s. And so uh, this Bismarck, this ship, the Bismarck, sank uh, the flagship of the uh, Royal Navy, the British Navy, which was called HMS Hood. HMS Hood had about, oh, it had like a crew of, I forget how many people on there, lots and lots, it was a huge, huge ship, and there were a lot of people on it. And, um, and only two survived. And so uh, of everybody on the ship, we're talking well over a thousand people were on this ship, and two survived the sinking of it. And so this early on in the war sets off a chase to find the Bismarck, the elusive Bismarck. And eventually the British do find the Bismarck and do sink the Bismarck, but it's not without some serious, serious effort. Um, the, the most impressive ship that the British had sank inside of minutes. Um, it, was, it was really, really, really hor uh, horrible loss for the British, and it was a terrible morale uh, uh, you know, sinker as well. So, um, okay, moving on. I want to double check something before I move on to the, this next part to make sure that I'm not getting ahead of myself, because this... Uh-oh, am I lagging here? Okay, looks like we've got people here. All right, good. Um, let me check something really quick because I want to make sure that I'm not going too far ahead uh, ahead of the documentary episode that you guys are going to be assigned for today. So let me really quickly uh, look into this. Uh, I have to go over here. To... Oh, I know, I know where it is. Uh, I was looking in the wrong spot. I'm sorry for this delay, folks. Let me just pull this up really quickly here. Okay. I have to figure out where um, episode two ends. 
Come on, let's go. So, uh, that brings us to uh, the end of our lecture for today. I will be uploading the new assignment um, and episode two of Apocalypse World War II, which is all on the rescue at Dunkirk, the fall of France, and um, the uh, Battle of Britain. So. That will be on what today's assignment is. I will make sure to upload both the video and the worksheet that goes along with it in the next few minutes here. And, um, and that'll give you time here from now until uh, noon or so to, uh, to watch that and finish it up and get it submitted. So that will cover our class period for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, always a pleasure to be able to talk to you guys about uh, about history. Gives me something to do, makes me feel like I'm uh, being productive. So uh, thank you for, for joining me. And I hope you enjoy uh, episode two. It's one of my favorite ones. The Battle of Britain is so, so, so important. And um, you know I have a particular affinity. I studied in London. Actually, when I was in college, I studied in um, I studied in London, uh, and I wrote a 65-page paper on the role of the British Royal Navy in World War II, in the first part of it before America entered the war. And I got to interview World War II veterans uh, who have since now passed away. Um, but I, I I got to interview and record the interview that I had with World War II vets um, through um, part of the Imperial War Museum which is a huge museum in Britain. Um, and there's a particular arm of the Imperial War Museum called the HMS Belfast Association. And so there's a ship on the Thames, which is the river that goes through London, called HMS Belfast. And it was a heavy cruiser ship. Uh, and it's now permanently docked. It's a military ship that's permanently docked and turned into a museum now. Uh, that served in World War II, and the HMS Belfast Association had a number of different veterans who I had a chance, who I had an opportunity to interview, who actually got to serve on the ship during the war, and got to talk to them about their life and, uh, and other things like that. So it was a really uh, important experience. So for me, this is a lesson that's near and dear to my heart, and it's something that I care a lot about, and and I find really interesting. So I hope that you enjoy it too. Um, Enjoy episode two, folks. Take care.